Thank you, Dr. Page. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Patricia Olson, who's a veterinarian and has a wealth of experiences uh, from three veterinary colleges, but also, importantly, as director of canine health and training uh, at uh, Guide Dogs for the Blind, as well as serving as president, um, has served as president at the Morris Animal Foundation. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the Institute of Medicine for allowing me to participate in this workshop. I think it's terrific. And I'd also like to thank Colorado State University who allowed me to hang out with their clinical trials uh, team in preparation for this talk. So I am going to, my background is I'm a veterinarian. I've done research. I've worked at Guide Dogs for the Blind. I was directed health and training. You'll see me refer to that here a little bit later. I had the honor to be the former president and CEO of Morris Animal Foundation, which funds roughly 300 research studies a year. And I'm board certified in the American College of Animal Welfare. So with that, just as a background, I'm going to talk to you about advancing the health of family members, all family members, through strategic, collaborative, and humane research. So I wanted to, a lot of this has already been said, but I wanted to kind of give you some more information just to really um, drive this point home. How are pets really viewed as family members? So here's a Harris poll, 2011. Over 2,000 adults were polled, and these were pet-owning uh, adults. Seven in 10 surveyed had a dog, and half had a cat. Although, as you um, heard yesterday, cats actually outnumber dogs um, in U.S. households when you look at the total number. 92% of dog owners and 91% of cat owners considered their pet to be a family member. Over 50% said that they allowed the animals to sleep in their beds. So just as Dr. Vale said, Snoopy's no longer in the doghouse. 33% of owners frequently purchased holiday presents for their animals. And then we had some discussion, the organizing committee at least, you know, should we be even referring to these animals as pets, or should they be talked about as companion animals? And I think as maybe Dr. James Serpell said at the University of Pennsylvania, it probably doesn't matter so much what we call them as long as we really truly respect them. So are they pets or companion animals? So just here, um, a blog that was um, from the Smithsonian organization saying dog owners are now pet parents. People increasingly treat their dogs like canine children. And research on the interspecies bond says that that's OK. We have, however, in the Journal of Animal Ethics say, should we really talk about them as pets? Or is that a degrading term? And some animal rights groups um, feel that maybe pets is not the most appropriate term. Um, however, when you look at the public, and sometimes we have to always remember, what about the public? We've got uh, major um, industries here, PetSmart and Petco. And these are large pet retail organizations that I'm sure you're probably all aware of. They've got pet in their name, and they always talk about the pet parent. Now, I wanted to just, um, I don't know, is Dr. Trent still here? Doc? Maybe he had to leave. Um, Dr. Trent gave you some really inf interesting information yesterday. And he's a good friend of the former president and CEO of PetSmart. And if you think as you go forward with clinical trials, they've got a huge database. You know, we, we swipe our cards. And the value of that potential database, even for clinical trials or recruiting people, is quite amazing. So how we can even use the public in another venue, um, I think, is very exciting. As someone said, we haven't talked much about the cat. But I did go on a blog that um, said, I am not a pet parent. I refuse to consider myself as a pet parent. And this person had a cat. And I think, as those of you know who are cat owners, I being one, um, probably Henry, my cat, doesn't consider me um, his parent at all. Uh, he allows me to live with him. <laughs> so this is my coffee mug that uh, my husband got for me. It's not me, it's you. 
the grumpy cat. I actually, I came back from a meeting um, in February from Germany, and I sat next to a Google exec. And so I started to talk, and I said, well, what do you spend your day doing? He said, cat videos. It's like the number one video. And I'm inundated with cat videos, and I'm trying to figure out the demographic of this population. So don't forget the cat. <clears throat> I'm having trouble here. I, I apologize. So just along that line then, companion animals as family members. I think some of you may remember Katrina and the pictures we saw where people were on rooftops along with their animals and refusing to be evacuated unless the pet went with them. That resulted then in the federal government passing the Pets Act in 2006, Pets Evacuation and Transportation Standards that requires state and local emergency preparedness to always consider taking the pet as well. And then I know this is a, a research group and a scientific group, so probably several of you have seen April of this year, the dog hit the cover of science and it says, a lasting bond, the secret of our deep ties with dogs. So dogs, according to this article, the first thing domesticated before plants and other animals. Oxytocin facilitates social connection between humans and dogs. Many humans feel genuine friendship, love, and social attachment with their dogs. And a common brain network for emotion is activated when human mothers view their children or their dog, a similar um, pathway. So obviously, a very significant uh, family member to many, many people in our country. A little bit then about companion animals in research. Generally, women are less inclined to favor animal research. And women outnumber men in animal protection movements. So if you look at donors, for example, at many of the national animal welfare agencies or animal rights groups, they may be predominantly female. But you should also know that greater than 80% of the donors when I was at Morris Animal Foundation who funded animal research were women. And 11% of those donors had PhDs. So I don't discount women, they want research done, but they want it done really well and with uh, humane research being a focus. So their attitudes may vary. Certainly cosmetic research where an animal is harmed for cosmetics generally is not considered to be, in many cases, their first choice for research. But a study where animals might also be helped to prevent disease and to also see how new drugs might be developed that are more efficacious and gentler that's something that they would want. So again, um, as we haven't talked a whole lot at this conference about disease prevention or what we learn in early diagnosis, but kudos to the Morris Animal Foundation for their 3,000 golden retriever enrollment and what we might learn. And we've got researcher, uh, the PI here from the University of Washington who hopes to have a 100,000 dog longitudinal study. So how might we, how might we really help these individuals as they move their research efforts ahead. And then I wanted just to mention a little bit about kids. And maybe that's because I'm a grandmother, I don't know. Um, but children can be affected throughout their lifetime based on positive or negative treatment of the pet. So when we're focusing on, you know, let's get this dog enrolled and let's, in, let's consent, you know, don't forget the kids. We did a survey when I was consulting for the American Humane Association, and this was of their members and Facebook friends, and they had the survey open for one week, <clears throat> and they had about 300 people respond. And what was interesting, we asked just a few questions, but it was, tell, pick a pet in your childhood memory, and then we want to ask you a couple questions about it. 71.8%, so 72% selected a dog that they wanted to be surveyed about. And then we asked them about an animal who they had, had, they, what, had this animal died from injury or disease? And what was, do, do they still think about that? Nearly 40% of those said that, that they still thought about that event. 
And not only did they think about it, but we had open comments. If that was a positive experience, they thought really fondly about their parents, the veterinarian involved, the researchers, but if it was a negative experience, they did not. So this has been said yesterday, but if I have a couple of things to try to drive home, and I think it's already there, consider the companion animal in clinical trials, think child patient. Think child patient. Is the trial designed to prevent disease or provide new therapies? Who will serve as the independent advocate for the animal? Just remember, it can't sign that informed consent. Understanding that the animal cannot give consent, what are appropriate safeguards to ensure animal welfare is addressed? And Dr. Page um, has given us many things to think about. Should conventional therapies ever be delayed? Now, there's a lot of discussion on standard of care that we've heard yesterday and today. And um, I think we just, it's probably good for us just to professionally, at least for me in my profession. So if you look at guidelines from the Society of Veterinary Medical Ethics, it says no animal or group of animals should ever receive a placebo for a disease that requires treatment. So now we can say, well, there really is no standard of care for many of the cancers, okay. Is that how you communicate your treatment to an owner who's not in a clinical trial? Do you say to me, you know, there's no standard of care, let's just give you some pain medications for your dog, go home, sugar water's just as good. So I think we have to be really clear. You know, if it's not standard of care as a conventional treatment, but how do we really um, bring that client to the best of our ability into those discussions. And then the American Veterinary Medical Association says animals undergoing standard of care treatment, so they're talking about standard of care treatment, and we may disagree with this, but this is a recent document with a veterinary client-patient relationship that is not influenced by their involvement in a clinical study has a different process than if that standard of care is delayed. What are the limits on tissue or blood collection? You know, just, just remember again, child, patient. This isn't a large research rat. This is a family member. So how many samples, what's appropriate, and um, how do we do that? And then do companion animals benefit? We have to be really, really clear here. These people are vulnerable owners. So if they don't understand, or if we test them, as Dr. Vail said, a day later, and they really haven't understood, do they really believe they're enrolling in a study, even if we say a phase zero or a phase one study may not be effic for efficacy, do they get that? Do they understand that that's what they're doing? Because I think that they are a vulnerable population. So talk about then the pet owner during clinical trials. And I think we need to think of vulnerable population. And somebody said yesterday, well, maybe the IACUC's not quite as stringent as the IRB. And I'm wondering why we maybe don't have an IRB in these type of trials. So I wanted to share a picture here of a friend of mine, Michael Hankson. Um, Michael was a graduate of Guide Dogs for the Blind, where I worked for several years. And this is he. He's been he's blind since birth, and his dog, Roselle. Michael's a business guy and a finance guru, and he was on the 78th floor of the World Trade Center, Tower One, on 9-11. And Roselle, his dog, carefully guided him down 78 flights. Halfway down, they found a woman who was in the stairwell sobbing, who said to Michael, I can't go any farther. I can't see because of all the dust and particles. He said, I haven't been able to see forever. Take my arm, let's go. Roselle did that. So now I want you to say, okay, Michael's your client, and let's assume Roselle has cancer. How are you going to consent this? How are you going to consider Michael and Roselle? Are you going to give it imaging materials that takes Roselle out of his life for three weeks? 
I mean, that was discussed yesterday, and I know the presenter said that's not an option. So can a distressed, worried owner give true consent? Who could independently serve the emotional needs of the owner? And I think it's going to be difficult for, you know, as good as those study teams are for an owner sometimes to call them. So who might be that independent person that could say, how are things going? How might the primary veterinarian be involved? There's tremendous trust in many cases from that primary practitioner. So how do we get them involved in being able to explain things that maybe the client is not so um, comfortable in asking the team itself? How are owners surveyed at the end of a study to determine effectiveness in communication? Do we really understand that? How are communications effectively relayed to diverse populations? You know, we have tremendous numbers of people in Colorado who may not be English speaking. Are we doing a good job in really um, having informed consent in a diverse uh, style? And then looking at the dog again, been with us for a long, long time, defied as our guide, loyal partner, and best friend. So what might happen if animals and animal owners are carefully considered? And this is why I think this workshop is so amazing. And I know many of you from my various past lives in the profession, and I have so much respect for the work that you're doing. And think of what you might be able to do going forward. Pet owners become partners in research design and execution, and don't dismiss what they could provide to you. I've always said I learn more from the questions my students ask me than I think I imparted to them. So always listen. All family members are considered for future enrollment into well-designed clinical trials. Disease prevention and gentler efficacious therapies are advanced for both animals and people. And if that's done, enrollment, outcomes, and satisfaction might increase for all. You know, you have to all sit here and think. I'm thinking about the future, my children and my grandchildren and my pets, okay? And I want you just for a minute to not think about publications or profits. How might you strategize and prioritize and collaborate that you could really change the face of medical research? Now, I know we always say cancer is a very complex disease, and I'm sure that's true. But I think sometimes when us humans say something is complex, it's because we don't understand it. And, and we can go back in history to say that that's probably true. So is it complex, or we just have to look at it differently? And I wanted to just share this picture. This is my daughter and I in Switzerland a few years ago. And yeah, I come from Colorado, so I have to use a, a mountain uh, picture. But anyway, this is the Matterhorn, rising 14,692 feet into the air, located between Italy and Switzerland. It was the last alpine peak to be summited. And it remained an impossible trek for many decades. And everybody tried on the Italian side. This is a photograph here at the bottom um, corner that I took from the Swiss side. And it looked so horrible when you looked at it, so complex, that no one, they just knew that that was impossible. So come along Edward Wimper of London, an artist hired to make sketches of the mountains between Switzerland and Italy, not a mountain climber. And he asked a question. Why had the Matterhorn never been attempted from the Swiss side? And they said, well, let's look at it. It's impossible. But he said, might the terrible appearing face of the stone be an illusion? Well, on July 13, 1865, Wimper and six others set out on an unlikely journey that would amaze all, a hidden staircase of ridges that led them to the top. He was 25 years old at the time. So always revisit your paradigms. And I'm not saying that cancer isn't complex, but just think of the collective wisdom in this room and how it could advance um, the health of all family members. So what are those illusions that we need to overcome? And how, again, can our profession increase collaboration, strategies, and successful outcomes? 
so that both animals and people can be helped. So is it time for a new medical research model? You know, we, we talk about models where we say, yes, here's an animal that might serve as a model for human disease. But just remember evolutionary biology. There's over 60,000 vertebrae species. Think of the tremendous clues that are present. We had a great presentation yesterday about canine transmissible venereal tumor and its evolutionary pathway. Fabulous. But the Tasmanian devil is facing extinction from an infectious facial cancer that's pretty recent. Why? What is that? I, I serve on the Smithsonian Advisory Board. I'm going to their meeting when I, um, after this meeting. And think of the other tremendous clues for cancer research and development. The health of our patients will be our first consideration. Vulnerable groups and individuals will receive protection. The welfare of animals used in research must be respected. And just thinking of the World Medical Association Declaration of Helsinki saying, our patients must be our first consideration. And I would say veterinary patients as well. We'll treat dogs with considerable compassion, knowing that they trust us to do what's right for them. We will not prolong pain and suffering. And we as veterinarians have uh, the ability to provide a humane euthanasia when necessary. We will release all clinical trial information so that others might learn, both because of success and both failures. And this was World Health Organization in Science of 2015, who's backing um, clinical trial public access. And those of you who work at state-funded institutions or if you work for federal agencies, remember you have an obligation to the public. So how do you get data to them as fast as you can? And we will advance the health of all family members through strategic and collaborative research. So I've always you know, kind of thought that maybe what we needed was a National Institute of Animal Health that would collaborate very, very closely with the National Institute of Health but not as separate silos. I think sometimes within our own organizations, we see separate silos. How could we really learn from each other and strategize? Um, we've got the leadership uh, group here today from uh, the new, one of the new veterinary schools, Midwestern University, and they're developing an institute for healthcare innovation. And they're looking at how can they do research better and more efficiently. And you should all talk to them and give them advice. How can that move ahead? And I want to also acknowledge Dr. Diane Brown from Morris Animal Foundation here today, the Chief Scientific Officer. And she can correct me if any of my, uh, any of my information here on uh, Morris Animal is uh, not current. I think I'm OK. But thanks, Diane, for all your hard work. So Matthew. Matthew Frank from the Skippy Fund is here in the front row. And Matthew reminded me to give you this quote. And thank you, Matthew. I think it's perfect. Always the more beautiful answer who asks the more beautiful question. So this workshop, now when we go into this panel, or you do your debriefing after lunch, if you had unlimited resources, and with the expertise and knowledge of this group in this room, what do you want to do? Don't think right now, for the moment, profits and publications or proprietary information. Think of children and grandchildren, the world, your pets, the animals that you lost as children that you hope future animals will not have to succumb as they did. How do you want to take this forward? Because I maintain you've got a tremendous opportunity to do that. Thank you.